Hello and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this webinar titled Questions You Will Miss on Test Day. Hopefully you won't miss them after our conversation. Uh, I am super pumped to be here with fellow MST tutor and just uh, brilliant uh, bow tie wearing gentleman, Dr. Joe Hansen. Joe, could you introduce yourself to the crowd? Absolutely. My name is Dr. Joe, and I've been working with med school tutors for about four years as an individual tutor. And in that time frame, I've tutored somewhere in the ballpark of 300 or so students for over 5,000 hours for pretty much every medical board exam that exists in medical school, level one, step one, step two, level two, all that stuff. So I'm excited to share with you guys some of my experience with some really difficult board style questions this evening with uh, my wonderful partner here in action, Dr. Murdoch. And I didn't prepare any compliments, but he's amazing and brilliant. So I'll say that and then I'll hand it back over to him to introduce himself and his background. Oh, thank you so much. You're going to make me blush. <laughs> um, like Joe was mentioning, I am uh, tutor. I've been with MST for a number of years, uh, tutoring predominantly step one, but a couple of other exams as well. I'm a current internal medicine intern, and I'm really excited to talk to you today and impart some of the tips and tricks that have worked for myself and for the students that I have worked with. Um, very briefly, um, I've mentioned MST, med school tutors, uh, a collection of medical students, residents, interns, even attendings who have firsthand experience with a variety of testing uh, board style uh, standardized tests um, and who are eager and excited to share with you their success, both in terms of content, but also in terms of strategy, um, advising. Uh, we're very excited to work with folks on a very individualized sort of way. And so if uh, what we share with you today piques your interest, you think that you might want to hear a little bit more about what we do, there'll be time for question and answer in the end, and the contact information is at the bottom of the slide. But without much further ado, I wanted to quickly give an agenda about what we'll be covering today. First, a bit of a one-off topic, we'll talk about test day strategy, when to take the exam. There's a lot of changes happening in medical education, a lot of changes on the horizon for standardized testing, and we just wanted to share some thoughts on that. And then we'll really transition into the meat of the webinar today, and it'll focus on tricky questions and how to navigate them. And the way we uh, conceptualize these tricky questions are around the kinds of topics that tend to trip up our students, where sometimes the question that being asked isn't totally clear um, a style of question, such as the up and down arrow that can get folks confused, that can take a lot of time if you don't have a clear strategy for how to approach it. How do you handle those situations where they're asking something super nitty gritty, you know it or you don't, um, even if you don't have that particular piece of information uh, memorized, there are still ways to maximize your chances of getting some points on that question. And then lastly, just some examples of curveballs, which happened to us all. It happened to me on step one. How do you handle uh, those situations to really get the best score that you possibly can? And as mentioned here, we'll have a question and answer period at the end, but really throughout, we want you all to be uh, very active in the chat. Um, the panelists will be able to see what you put in the chat, but um, the other uh, attendees will not. So feel free to put anything in there. And uh, really, you get the most gains out of this when you are as active as possible. So if you see me turning to the side, it's because I'm looking at the chat, I'm typing, I'm responding. Uh, so please be as active as possible. So uh, with that, let's jump into our first topic. Joe, what do you tell your students when they bring up this question of when to take the exam? All right, this question is going to become more and more pressing as the year moves on and we get closer to January. So it's been announced that from the USMLE that step one will go to pass fail at some point in the future as early as January 2022. Um, unknown exactly when that will happen or exactly how that will happen, but we should anticipate that if we want to get a three digit score for the exam, we should probably plan to take it before January of next year. Now, for many students right now who are thinking about taking step one, that's likely going to happen before clinical rotations usually begin in midsummer or towards the fall. And so that's not as big of a question unless you're considering delaying the exam 
for a variety of reasons, personal and professional, in which case you have to weigh the option of taking the exam later or taking it now if your school affords you that opportunity. So a couple questions to ask yourself. What score do you need to get if, to get into the field of your choice? That is to say, what would be your minimum standard that you would be willing to accept to apply confidently into your field? What is your standardized test taking history? How strong are you in standardized tests in general? Uh, and generally, what would you have to do like to your timeline of your medical education in order to fit the exam in if, for instance, you're already on clinical rotations and would be forced to take step one, let's say, during clinical rotations, which would be a pretty gargantuan task that's a huge mitigating factor. In general, the recommendation that we're going to provide here is if you can take the exam before January 2022, if it is feasible and possible, and you will pass it on your first attempt, you should take it because the three-digit score that you get on this exam carries with you even after the exam goes pass fail. If you apply for residency after four years of an MD PhD in the future, you still can use your three-digit step one score in applications. It will still be there. Your score still exists if you obtain it before January. When the exam goes pass fail, you will not have a three-digit score. You will have pass or fail. And generally speaking, any information beyond passing or failing the exam is going to provide a benefit to you since any other applicant that has a pass fail score versus your three digit number must as be assumed to be at the passing threshold, whereas you are definitely above it if you got a passing score on the exam with the three digit number associated. In short, if you can fit it in and you feel confident that you will take the exam and pass it and not obtain a failing score, we're gonna push for you guys to try to take the exam before January to get it out of the way, knock it out, and get a number associated to your name and to your application for residency in the future. Um, anything to add to that, Moses? Not really. I think that the key thing is to know yourself, know your goal, um, and use the strategies that, that Joe has highlighted. Um, this is a time of some uncertainty as these tests change how they're being reported, but that doesn't mean that um, it, it, that you don't have an opportunity to put your best foot forward. And I think you should take that opportunity. With that in mind, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what makes a question tricky. I alluded to this when I went over the agenda, but I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into that topic. First of all, you know, our title may be a little bit uh, like a, a little bit of a buzz uh, word. They're trying to lure people in. I want to first put folks at ease. Test writers in general are humans just like you or me. They are not explicitly trying to trick you. That being said, there are types of exams that tend to lead to confusion and to incorrect answer choices, and they fall into patterns. So that's the first thing. Walk into the exam feeling confident that you've studied, you know your material, you know, you've used the best resources, and you should be able to reason yourself to one best answer choice. What are some of these buckets that, uh, of, of questions that tend to trip people up? The first bucket, and I'll do, go in order based on what is on the slide, is that there's some sort of confusion about what exactly is being asked, right? Uh, it may be that you know a lot about a topic, but if you misunderstand the thrust of the question, you might in your head be thinking of the right diagnosis, the right basic science fact, but if it isn't answering the question that's being asked, you don't get points for effort, unfortunately, on step. You only get points for picking the one best correct answer to the question that is being asked. The second question that is tricky, that can uh, take a lot of time um, and that trips people up are those in which there are multiple questions in one. And the classic uh, version of this is that the up and down arrow question where you have maybe different electrodes or different physiologic parameters. And you first have to understand the clinical scenario that's being presented. And then you have to understand how that clinical scenario, how that diagnosis impacts multiple aspects of physiology or multiple different laboratory testing. And it's easy to get trip, tricked up because you might know part of the answer, but then you might forget how it impacts a different part of the physiology. And there's tips and tricks to narrow down your answer choices such that you pick the one best answer. And then of course, this happened to me, you end up seeing a question that um, tests minutia. It tests something 
that is either you know it or you don't. There's not a whole lot of reasoning that goes into it, but that doesn't mean that you can't uh, improve your odds of answering the right question or getting to the right, the right answer. Um, and lastly, there are those questions that you read them and you just sort of go, huh? Like, I don't remember this being in first aid or I don't remember this coming up in my preclinical courses. Um, and that happened to me on the exam. The first thing to say is that don't freak out when this happens on the exam or if it happens on the exam. It's a minority of questions that fall into that category. And honestly, the biggest piece of advice I have is to take those questions in stride, answer them the best you can, and then keep moving on to those questions that are very solidly within the scope of the exam. But that being said, our task for the next 45 minutes or so, 30 to 45 minutes, is to present you with questions that fall into these different buckets, to showcase for you our reasoning on how to approach these questions, um, and give you all an opportunity to activate your thinking and, and uh, answer some interesting questions as well. Do you have anything to add on that, Joe? I'll simply say that was excellently stated, uh, the different types of things that are gonna trip students up on the exam. I just wanna emphasize that note that you made about taking things in stride. Um, I will actually say that it's going to be a win, not an if, when it comes to finding something that you just don't know on the test. It's inevitable, you've got 280 questions on there, and a lot of those questions are gonna be experimental for that matter that aren't gonna to count towards your grade, that are being uh, used to generate statistics for future exam takers it's inevitable you're gonna to run to something that really makes you stressed out, fatigued, angry, et cetera, because you've never seen it before. So it is very important that you don't let one question that you don't know the answer to influence your mood, attitude, or thinking for future questions that you might know the answer to if you're able to supply the proper reasoning to them. So we're gonna to try to give you tips and tricks to work around the harder questions that you see in here, but it's imperative that you build your stamina and you get to the point where even a difficult question doesn't stop you from answering the straightforward, simple, easy quote unquote stuff that you can easily grab for free points later on on the same block. But otherwise, really well stated Moses, thanks for leading us through the, the main ideas here. Absolutely. So Joe, take us away on this first question under the heading, what exactly is being asked? All right, so we're gonna start off with the doozy because we're starting off with the, what are they asking me style question here. So first things first, I'm gonna read through this question and I'm gonna ask you guys questions along the way to make sure that you're engaged and kind of paying attention to what we're saying here. So I'll start by reading the question itself down at the bottom where they ask us which of the following most likely contributed to the patient's neurologic symptoms. And right off the bat, alarm bells are going off in my head because I see a chest X-ray. And I'm thinking neurologic symptoms, chest X-ray, things aren't really computing. So they tell us that we have a 65-year-old man with COPD, atrial fibrillation, hypertension, and type 2 diabetes coming to the ED to assurance of breath for three days. The patient's condition began with a runny nose, itchy eyes, and a sore throat. So, all right, guys, time for you guys to interact a little bit and ask you this question. What would you call this? A person who's coming in with this medical background, COPD, atrial fibrillation, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and they just kind of like having runny nose, itchy eyes, sore throat, and like just feel worse. They have shortness of breath, their day is going really bad. What would you call this? Go ahead and type it into the chat box. Let me know what you think. I'm gonna give you guys a chance to type in a few answers here, a few students to answer here. I've already got one correct answer, so good job to that person who's already responded. Got a couple more here. All right, I'm gonna ask for at least a couple more answers here. A couple more people type something in. What do you think you would diagnose this person with given their medical background and the presentation of kind of like feeling bad? Okay, I got a couple more here. So I, the most popular answer right now is saying superimposed infection and COPD exacerbation. If somebody comes in with what might be a routine head cold then Moses or I, would actually end up being a pretty significant medical problem for a person who has underlying COPD. It sounds like this person just has a cold and COPD, but a cold for a COPD patient is not a benign event, and we would call that a COPD exacerbation. So uh, they tell us that his symptoms progress to a productive cough, wheezing, and dyspnea, and we would call that most likely pneumonia. On examination, blood pressure is 150 over 90, pulse is 110 and irregular, but we anticipate that because he has atrial fibrillation. Oxygen saturation is 91% on room air, which is not perfect. An examination shows a mildly overweight man in moderate respiratory distress and lung sounds are decreased throughout with prolonged expiration and bilateral wheezes. And the patient started on 
inhaled bronchodilators, systemic corticosteroids, high flow facial mask oxygen, and then IV lorazepam for agitation. And his chest x-ray is shown. And I'll point out that this chest x-ray shows really large lung fields. There is hyper expansion of these lungs with flattened diaphragms that don't have the domed appearance that you expect. And the angle formed between the diaphragm and the chest wall and the ribs is pretty blunted. You'd say that's a blunted costophrenic angle. So overall, this is a bit of a confusing question because they told us a person's coming with COPD, they have a COPD exacerbation, check out all the medications you gave them. And they gave us a ton of things on here. So the question might arise to you, well, what are they actually asking for here? Because they kind of like gave away the entire case, what we were supposed to intervene with already. And the final part of this is them saying, 30 minutes later, he is lethargic and confused. And then shortly thereafter, he experiences a generalized tonic clonic seizure. So I'm gonna ask you guys, of the interventions we did, which of them, inhaled bronchodilators, corticosteroids, high flow facial mask oxygen, lorazepam, could have caused this patient's neurological condition? Let's start with that question. Okay, I've got two answers so far from everybody. Thank you very much for answering. Couple more, come on in. Okay, very good. We are exactly split between the two answers that I wanted, so thank you very much. We have number one, lorazepam, and number two, oxygen. And so two competing camps of thought here. Number one, benzodiazepine, that does neuro stuff. Maybe that's our answer. Number two, oxygen. Why would that cause problems? We'll kind of get into that in a second. So we look at the question again, which of the following contributed to the neurological symptoms? And the neuro symptoms here were lethargy, confusion, seizure. So I'm gonna ask you guys a separate question here. What treats a seizure? Somebody comes into your ED right now and you're gonna treat a seizure, hit the chat, what are you gonna treat them with? I know you guys can't see each other's answers, but I can see them. And I'm seeing a lot of people saying benzos and lorazepam. So for the students who are saying, oh, maybe the lorazepam caused the seizure, that's the therapy for a seizure, not the cause of the seizure. So we gotta be very careful with how we're answering this question because it would initially seem to us based on the presentation that we did a bunch of good interventions for this patient and then also a benzo, which actually is not totally necessary in every COPD exacerbation and now they have a seizure. In reality though, the benzo probably isn't the cause of our problem because the benzo is a therapy for a seizure and is rarely the initiating event for seizure specifically unless we're talking about withdrawals or something along those lines. So now the hard question, the initiating event here is oxygen. The students who answered that were correct. And we look down at the answer choices, what caused these symptoms and none of them say oxygen. So now we have to figure out what do they really want from me here? We know an intervention did this, but how did the intervention do this? Can anybody tell me what they think the answer is in the chat now, knowing that oxygen given to this COPD patient was actually a bad move to make? Okay, once again, really enjoying the interaction here. Thank you very much for answering, guys. Lots of A's and B's here. That's why I'm seeing a lot of answer choices. And then one answer that says between A and B, not sure. I love it <laughs> because a lot of us aren't sure about this one. So here's the trick behind this question. Oxygen is actually fairly dangerous for patients with advanced COPD because patients who are breathing very slowly with poor oxygen saturation are lying on their hypoxic drive. That's the simple answer that we're gonna to use tonight at the very least. There's a little bit more to it, but for now, we're losing our hypoxic drive if we blast this patient with oxygen. It actually is tolerable for COPD patients to go down to an oxygen saturation of 89 or 88%. And if they're at 91%, as this patient was, we didn't need to give them oxygen because oxygen is going to remove our hypoxic drive, which means we breathe slower. And what direction does my carbon dioxide go if I breathe slower? Everybody answer that for me. Increase up, up, up. And what answer choice talks about CO2 going up? Answer choice A. So awesome job, everybody, getting here. This is a really hard question. This is a very clinically oriented question. We made our way there, though. 
And what we had to determine along the way was first, what is happening? What are we treating with? Why are we treating with it? And then which of these things would have caused the side effect? And then how would this thing have caused this side effect in this person? And if we immediately jump to the thing that comes to our mind first, which is brain problem benzo, let's just do it and be done with it. We're never gonna get to the correct answer on this question. And we have to be very careful about piecing together what information is being provided to us and what the question actually wants. And what the question wanted, the question that's actually being asked is which one of these things is a side effect of one of our therapies that would lead to a seizure. Anything to add to that, Moses? Do we miss anything? That, that was very, that was so masterful. The, the <laughs> other comment I'm, I'm learning from you as, as, as you're teaching, it's, it's really amazing. One of the um, hangups that I see students get on is they make a partial association with an answer choice. So for instance, cerebral vasoconstriction. Wait, I remember some association between CO2 and vasoconstriction. So it's tempting. It's tempting to do that. Hypocalcemia. Isn't there something about albumin, pH, and calcium? There is. And this pa patient's probably in a respiratory uh, uh, Acidosis. Acidosis, yes. So, so there's th these answer choices are seductive, but when you feel yourself being pulled towards an answer choice, stop and ask yourself, is it as it's presented in the question or is it the opposite, right? Does uh, high CO2 cause vasoconstriction or vasodilation? Does acidemia cause high free ionized calcium or low free ionized calcium? And that can prevent you from sort of falling into some of these traps that come up. Otherwise, amazing, amazing uh, description there. Um, I will move on to another question and uh, we can come back and answer some of, oh, uh, Joe, it looks like there might be something coming through in the chat. Well, I figure I should clarify too. So let's go back Please. to the question really quick because I did cut us short a little bit. Why does CO2 retention then lead to a seizure? We kind of did leave that hanging a little bit. So here's my simple explanation for this. Carbon dioxide is a trash molecule and our brain wants to get rid of the trash. The way the brain can increase the number of trash trucks cleaning out this garbage is by sending more blood through the brain. CO2 directly causes cerebral vasodilation and the lack of CO2 causes cerebral vasoconstriction. So if you wanted to vasoconstrict a patient's cerebral arteries, you would hyperventilate them. That could help prevent cerebral edema. But if you allow CO2 to build up, as is happening in this patient, as they start breathing less, they will develop cerebral vasodilation. And you might think that's good, more blood to the brain. Well, too much blood to the brain is gonna cause cerebral edema. And most likely what we're gonna see in a patient like this one is hyperperfusion of their brain more than is necessary because of the brain's desire to clear the trash, to get rid of the CO2. And that edema then causes inflammation and the development of, of the seizure, the loss of consciousness, et cetera, et cetera. Awesome. Cool. All righty. So I've alluded a few times to the up and down arrow questions. And here we have an example. I'll go through my thought process as well as the correct answer choice. So first, just like Joe did, we're going to read the question, which says, which of the following is the most likely set of laboratory values for this patient? And my eyes go down and I'm seeing a bewildering array of numbers. So I'm already feeling a little tachycardic because I'm not quite sure how I'm gonna pick amongst the different phenas, the different urine sodiums and the different urine osmolalities. But I take a deep breath and we read the question. It says a 68 year old woman comes to the physician after noticing blood in her urine. I'll stop there and just say, I try to use schemas as much as I can. So blood in the urine, immediately I'm activating a schema. Is it glomerular bleeding? Is it post-glomerular bleeding? And those have differentials, but I don't dwell on it because it's still early. Next line says she has had four episodes of bloody urine over the last two months. So this is frank blood that the patient has noticed. That's important. It's not microscopic blood that's incidentally noticed on a UA, um, frankly, a bloody urine. She otherwise feels well and denies abdominal pain, dysuria, fevers, chills, or recent illnesses. Her only medical problems are osteoporosis and osteoarthritis in her knees. She has smoked two packs of cigarettes per day for the last 50 years 
and drinks one to two glasses of wine per day. So that's a hundred pack year history of smoking. I combine that with the age and red flags are going up. There may be something malignant happening in this patient. She denies illicit drug use. A febrile with a temperature of 98.2. Blood pressure is within a good range, 110 over 62. Heart rate is not elevated at 70. And the physical exam reveals no ab abnormalities. Here's a key sentence. The renal ultrasound reveals bilateral hydronephrosis. And then we go back to our question. So again, when I see bilateral hydronephrosis and I see FINA, right? In what scenarios do I see that? It's typically in the setting of evaluations of kidney injury. And when I combine that with the bilateral hydronephrosis, I'm suspicious that of the pre-renal, intra-renal, and post-renal causes, I'm probably going to be in the post-renal because the post-renal type of kidney injury is the type that would lead to something like hydronephrosis. And in a 68-year-old with a 100-pack year smoking history, I'm suspicious that there is some malignant process that is leading to obstruction. And hopefully we will explain the, the urine studies by keeping that diagnosis in the background. And I think it's really important to go into these questions with a diagnosis in mind because it helps us eliminate answer choices. And my strategy is as follows. I pick the one column that I'm most confident in and I start screening out based on that. So I'm, I'm an internal medicine intern. Uh, FINAs are in my blood, pun intended. So we'll start there. And we remind ourselves that, you know, one, 3.5, the exact number doesn't necessarily matter. It matters what bucket do you put it in. So I'm asking the question, do I think this patient has a pre-renal cause of everything that's going on in this vignette? And the answer is no. So I would expect a FINA that um, is on, you know, the, the edge, but probably not super, super, super low, right? So I'm not thinking it's something like E, for instance. I'm thinking this is a, an obstructive sort of process. Then I pick another column. What do I think is actually happening here? Well, I'm imagining the urine's trying to go to leave the kidneys, it's trying to travel down and exit the body, but something's blocking it up pressure is building up in the tubules and it's starting to malfunction. So what's happening? The kidneys are not able to reabsorb, right? They're not able to reabsorb water and they're not able to reabsorb electrolytes. So again, buckets. Let's go to the urine sodium. Do I expect the urine sodium to be high or low? So here I'm going to turn it over to the chat. Guys, in a post- renal sort of picture, do I expect the urine to have a lot of sodium or not a lot of sodium? And again, you know, it's, it, it just goes to show how challenging these questions are. Um, it goes to show that folks are, are split on this. So again, think about it. The kidneys are not able to reabsorb. Normally, keep in mind, normally, the kidneys are supposed to be uh, reabsorbing a lot of the sodium, right? And if they're failing to do that, then as folks are saying more and more now that I'm talking, it's, it's gonna be high because the kidneys are not doing what they're designed to do. So again, I'm eliminating B, I'm eliminating C. And again, we already sort of eliminated E, but we eliminated again because of the urine sodium. So now using a similar sort of thought process, go to the third column. And we ask ourselves, the kidneys are supposed to reabsorb um, electrolytes, they're supposed to reabsorb fluid, but if the pressure is super high and, there, and that function is disrupted, would we expect the urine osmolality to be high or low? If we can't reabsorb water, it will be low, right? Why? Because the water that's not being reabsorbed is diluting the electrolytes that are in the urine. This, and this is counterintuitive, despite the fact that the urine that you were, the, the sodium that we're measuring in the urine is actually high because there's a double defect. The defect is in, you can't uh, reabsorb the electrolytes, you can't reabsorb the water either. 
So the osmolality is on the lower end, even though the sodium that you measure in the urine is on the, is on the higher end because there's a, that double defect. And it's important to look at it sequentially like that because if you try to analyze two columns at the same time, you'll sort of start mixing it up. You'll think, oh, wait, if the sodium is high, then will that be concentrated, right? But instead, you pick each column and you say, what do I think is happening with the phena? What do I think is happening with the urine sodium? What do I think is happening with the urine osmolality? Joe, what do you have to add on that? I think that you did an excellent job of breaking down how we're supposed to pay attention to what is actually happening in the kidney. It's not working, right? Like that's, the, that's the thing we're going to start with. And then we start playing with our up-down arrows. I want to twist this idea a little bit when we're coming to the up-down arrow stuff. I think you nailed that perfectly. But I want to add to that, what if we have an up-down arrow question where we don't know exactly what we're supposed to be answering? And so I've got some stuff to add for our next question here. All right. So what if we have a, what exactly is this question asking? And it's an up-down arrow question at the same time. Um, I see that we do have some questions from that previous one. So we'll try to come back to them like towards the end to re-explain some of the concepts from that question. Um, so jumping into this one, we have a question reading, which of the following changes in serum laboratory values is most likely present in this patient? So we got labs going up and down here. And they tell us that we have a 30-year-old woman who is evaluated for a three-month history of progressive fatigue, decreased appetite, 10-pound weight loss. The patient has type 1 diabetes and noticed that decreased insulin requirement that she has decreased insulin requirements over this time. She has no other medical conditions and does not use tobacco, alcohol, or illicit drugs. Physical examination shows a generalized increased in pigmentation of the skin, especially involving the palmar creases. Measurement of serum cortisol before and after administration of exogenous ACTH shows no difference in levels. So I'm going to jump out there and say we've got a big picture idea thrown at us here, kind of a path mnemonic finding that we should probably latch on to, which is the hyperpigmentation. Somebody has hyperpigmentation. Why does that happen? Can anybody give me an idea of like what being too elevated in the blood might lead to this hyperpigmentation issue? Okay, all right. I'm seeing two correct answers since I asked a broad question here. Elevated melanocyte stimulating hormone secondary to elevated production of ACTH because of something called Addison's disease. So I see how some people mentioning cortisol being involved here. What type of cortisol problem would we have if we have fatigue, decreased appetite, and weight loss? Okay, I'm seeing low, decrease, low, not enough, insufficiency, hypo. Excellent. Great answers, everybody. So we have low cortisol in this patient, and that typically is called Addison's disease if we have destruction of the adrenal cortex. So we have an Addison's question. And then they go down and tell us what changes in serum laboratory values is most likely present in this patient. And we have sodium, potassium, bicarb, chloride. Not really much of a connection between cortisol and any of these electrolytes. Cortisol does not have a significant influence on the balance of any of these guys. Now, cortisol does do something that's interesting here in that cortisol is a glucocorticoid and it elevates our blood glucose levels. So if you have a patient with diabetes who has less cortisol, they have less blood glucose, which means they don't need as much insulin, which explains one of the findings in our question but it's not a glucocorticoid that I'm very worried about here. What kind of corticoid, what hormone are we actually supposed to be paying attention to if I'm gonna be talking about like sodium and potassium? Ooh, all right, I'm getting some great answers here. Aldosterone, mineral, mineralocorticoid is gonna be our best answer here to what actually we're trying to be figuring out. So this is my best example of what exactly are they asking? They're asking about somebody who cannot make aldosterone, somebody who has deficiency of the adrenal cortical hormones, but the case presentation is a characteristic example of what you would see in somebody who has hypocortisolism. So it's leading you to the Addison's disease by showing you one aspect of it and then asking you about an entirely different part. So we got down to the question, tried to answer the up down arrows here while explaining cortisol, we would be a little bit lost. Now that we know that we're talking about aldosterone. If we have a person who has low aldosterone, 
there's two major features that we need to pay attention to. Aldosterone always will influence blood pressure and potassium. So let's start with potassium. What is low aldosterone due to potassium values? Oh, wow. Somebody figured out how to put an arrow in the chat box. That's pretty cool. Uh, so <laughs> I'm seeing up high increased potassium. Yes, we have an elevated potassium value. So what is aldosterone, or rather let's stick with this, lack of aldosterone. What is a lack of aldosterone due to bicarbonate? Keeping in mind, not having aldosterone is kind of like the same thing as using spironolactone. So what happens when you use spironolactone or don't have aldosterone to bicarbonate values? Okay, so I'm seeing a bunch of, page, a bunch of individuals saying that we're looking at bicarbonate values that should be consistent with somebody who has metabolic acidosis. Using spironolactone causes metabolic acidosis, not having aldosterone around causes metabolic acidosis because we're not capable of excreting urinary hydrogen via the collecting duct, which is something that aldosterone favors. So I found two things that I know about my up-down arrows here. I've chosen that potassium should be elevated in this person. Bicarbonate should be low. If bicarb goes down, what happens to chloride? Does anybody have any guesses there? What's our chloride gonna do? All right, so as one goes down, one must go up. What I'm saying there is, if I have less of a negative charge with bicarb, I must have more of a negative charge with chloride. So finally, that leads us to a situation where we have to kind of decide, all right, well, what's gonna to happen to our sodium then? So. Uh, sorry, actually, I might have got myself confused here. I might have allowed chat to, to trick me into tricking them. I'm sorry about that, guys. If we have metabolic acidosis in this person, and we have a relatively low bicarb and high quote. Nope, I got it. I got it. I'll be back on track. So finally, what does aldosterone do to sodium? Does anybody have any answers for what aldosterone does to sodium? Aldosterone causes it to be absorbed. And if I'm not absorbing it, and that's a good answer by everybody in chat, if I'm not absorbing sodium, then what happens to my sodium value? Excellent. So everybody's saying it goes down. So we've decided that we are going to be losing sodium, low sodium, we're gonna have high potassium, we're gonna have low bicarbonate, we're gonna have high chloride, which gives us our answer choice of B. And what you guys saw there was my brain just entering a, a cycle there where it got trapped, flipping hyper and hypoaldosteronism in real time, which happens to the best of us like Moses and the second best of us like me all the time. So keep in mind, you should be jotting this stuff down on scratch paper as you go. That's my suggestion for these up, down, arrow questions. Going through each one that you know is true. And then once you've established, I'm positive that potassium goes up, bicarb goes down and chloride goes up. Then if you're not certain about like the last column or the last two columns, after you've written down what you know is true, then you can start playing problem solving with the question itself. All right. Um, Moses, anything to add to that? No, I mean, I think that was just a, a, such a great example of how tricky these can be. Um, and even as I was reasoning through this, it's like almost double negatives. Like it's an inhibitor that inhibits this. And so it, it comes back and raises something. Um, that, that was wonderful. I have, I have nothing really to add. Let me just uh, clarify a couple things real quick since I see some questions that I missed while I was uh, chatting up a storm there. Uh, a couple questions were, well, how do you know that this isn't a tumor in the adrenal glands that's knocking out cortisol production? You have two adrenal glands, you can't knock out cortisol production by having a tumor in one of them. So if somebody were to have hyperaldosteronism due to like an aldosterone secreting tumor, the other side can still produce cortisol, even if you did somehow smash the adrenal cortex entirely uh, on the diseased side. Another person had asked, uh, how do we know that aldosterone's gone? How do we correlate to aldosterone? And the answer is, if you have hypocortisolism with the presumption that this is an autoimmune phenomenon, and I did jump over this, then you probably knocked out the entire adrenal cortex. You cannot knock out one layer of the cortex. You have to knock out the full thing if it is an inflammatory or autoimmune process. We're not that targeted with our autoimmune attacks. And this patient has a background of type one diabetes. And one key takeaway for the exam is one autoimmune endocrinopathy begets other autoimmune endocrinopathy. Somebody who has type one diabetes is far more likely to develop Addison's disease, Hashimoto's disease, autoimmune gastritis uh, than other patients might be. And so we can reasonably conclude that this is an autoimmune mediated attack on the adrenal cortex. And that's 
how we can make the full jump into saying aldosterone should definitely be decreased. Okay, other questions I'll try to answer towards the end if you still have them. We got to move on to our next problem though. So I apologize if anything's still unclear at this moment. I'll try to answer in the chat a little bit too. All right. So now we enter the realm of sort of you know it or you don't. Um, and I'll, I'll start by saying that you read the, the question, which translocation is associated with this disease and the panic sets in because there's a bunch of numbers. And you're like, wait, I know 14's in a ton of them. How do I pick which one is which? And for me, having a, a very sort of stereotyped way in which I go through questions, such that even when I feel a little lost, I can fall back on a pattern of thought. So my first step is just read the question. Even if I'm a little nervous, I try to just center myself by going through my formula. And the first part is reading the question. So a 62-year-old man presents with enlarged lymph nodes. Again, I'm thinking infectious, inflammatory, malignancy, older gentleman. He first noticed an enlarged mass in his left armpit seven months ago, which grew smaller over the ensuing months. However, two months ago, he noticed the node started growing larger. On exam, his vitals are essentially normal. Blood pressure may be a little bit high, no fevers, heart rate's in a good place, setting well on room air. And on exam, there's a 2.5 centimeter hard, painless lump in the left axilla. The remainder of the exam is unremarkable. And an excisional biopsy shows you have some pathology to work with. And then again, with, we return to which translocation is associated with this disease. And so something that I often tell my students is, Answer the answer nested questions in series. The question is, which translocation is associated with this disease? The natural question then becomes, what disease are they talking about? So first, let's start big and narrow in. We have older gentlemen, longer time course, and we have uh, the character of the uh, lump in the axilla, that it is hard, and that it is painless. So I'm already thinking, okay, it's probably one of the lymphomas. It's probably a malignancy. Okay. Then I look at the actual pathology. And what I'm seeing, I'm, re I'm reminding myself that this is a lymph node. I'm trying to remember the normal lymph node architecture. And what I'm seeing is that there's a ton of these round structures packed super closely together, okay? And that makes me think, okay, it's, it's a normal structure of the, of the lymph node, but there's just too many of them. Next, I try to think of buzzwords. It, the lymph node grew, it grew smaller. I translate that into waxing and waning. It grows and then it gets smaller. So I'm already thinking it's probably not something like Burkitt lymphoma, right? Because that is the starry sky buzzword. Um, it's in the axilla. It's not in the gastrointestinal tract. So it's probably not something like a maltoma. And I'm already seeing some folks in the chat. This is the time to chime in. Which of the lymphomas do you think this uh, is best described by in the vignette and in the pathology. And you all are crushing it. Yes, follicular lymphoma. So now we've already made headway. Even if at this point you're still saying, I'm not quite sure which translocation it is, we've already made a diagnosis. And that's a major step forward. The next step is then to think, okay, I look at the answer choices. Can I start eliminating? Let's say theoretically, I, I actually don't know what's going on still. I don't know which translocation. Can I eliminate some some um, answer choices. Okay, um, let's take E for instance, 922. What disease, and put, put it in the chat, which disease is associated with the 922 translocation? And folks are chiming in really nicely. That's the Philadelphia chromosome, right? That's CML. And this doesn't strike us as CML. It's, that's a leukemia, not a lymphoma. Okay, um, and then F. Really, what disease do you think of with uh, 1517? Folks are saying, again, it's a leukemia, not a lymphoma. So already 
we've knocked out uh, the bottom two, right? Now, again, I'm just trying to illustrate some points. Um, we said this was follicular. Um, many lymphomas have chromosome 14 in them. A couple don't. And then I'm just going to simulate. Let's say that I'm the test taker and I remember, okay, um, I remember Burkitt's was 814, right? CMIC, IGH. I don't think that's it. And now you're down to three answer choices. I'll pause here and ask folks in the chat, which translocation do you think follicular, uh, follicular lymphoma is? And I'm seeing a lot of B. That's right, 14, 18 follicular lymphoma. So what are the takeaways here? If you don't know the answer to the question that's being asked, can you answer a question on the step to the right answer? So first, just make a diagnosis. And once you've done that, the second pearl here is, if you still don't know quite where to go, you might not know the right answer, but you certainly know some of the wrong answers and start eliminating those. And there's confidence that comes in eliminating those answer choices. And between the rest, you know, at a certain point, I have to say, you take a guess, but you want to make that guess as informed as possible by the diagnosis and avoiding picking an answer that you know is incorrect. Do you have other tips for your students when they encounter a question they just don't know the answer to, Joe? I completely agree with your approach. Answer a question that you can't answer. Make small steps towards it, although it is going to be the case sometimes that we simply don't know the answer to the question and we got to make a leap of faith or choose based on gut instinct. And so if you've done your due diligence and you've answered everything that you can about the question and we're simply stuck, is it 14, 18, is it 11, 18, 11, 14, I don't know. In that case, you should just go with the one that feels best. Unfortunately, we're gonna be in that position a few times on the exam. Try not to overthink it though and second guess yourself. The one problem that I see a lot of relatively strong students make is they'll say, well, I don't know what the answer is. So if I think it's A, I better go to B because I don't know what the answer is. So I should go with the other one because I don't want to go with the one I'm thinking because I know I'm wrong. So you can see how this kind of gets out of hand very quickly. Go with the one that you think it is if you have no other resource to utilize, but use your resources before you get to that point. All right, so I'm going to do a slight inversion of what Moses just did with that previous question. This one's a know it or you don't question mark question. Here they ask us which of the following chromosomal abnormalities is likely present. And again, we have a bunch of translocations. And it's a 34 year old man coming to the hospital due to multiple relapsing episodes of fever and night sweats despite multiple courses of antibiotic therapy. The patient reports feeling persistent fatigue, unexplainable bruising, and has had bleeding gums on several occasions. His temperature is mildly elevated at 100.2 Fahrenheit. On exam, he has mucosal pallor and multiple ecchymoses on his extremities, and his blood is drawn and his peripheral smear is shown. So we see a patient like this who's got this kind of mucosal pallor, multiple ecchymoses, repetitive infections, and it seems like nothing in his bone marrow is very well working. And like we had kind of seen with the previous question, but slightly different this time, we're gonna go with maybe like a leukemia. The reason I would say that is because we have no red blood cells, we have no platelets, that's the pallor and the ecchymoses that we're seeing there. And we have no functional white blood cells, meaning that we have nothing to fight off infections I must conclude that something's wrong with the bone marrow. And then we look at our peripheral smear, not a biopsy this time, but a peripheral smear. And I see lots of white blood cells with gigantic nuclei. So I actually do have lots of white blood cells, but they're immature. And so that means that I'm likely looking at a bone marrow cancer. I'm looking at leukemia in this case. Now, can anybody tell me what they see in that center white blood cell on the slide? What is our pathognomonic finding on this one? All right, so lots of good answers here. Keep them going. And you guys are right. This is an hour rod that we're seeing here. No B on the front of it. Two people in a row used Bauer rod. It's an hour rod, not like Jack Bauer, hour rod. So those hour rods that we're seeing, we see one very distinctly in the center of that middle white blood cell. And I'll point out, usually these images want you to look right at the center. They don't want you looking at the periphery. There we go. That's our hour rod right there. That tells us that we have what, what diagnosis? Uh, I'm told it was autocorrect. I was saying it was a Jack Bauer rod, so I believe it. Uh, what, what's our diagnosis here? 
Okay, good, excellent. A lot of AML, APL, so acute myelocytic leukemia or promyelocytic leukemia specifically. This is the one that has a translocation. So at the very least, we can say, all right, this is a translocation one. Our joke answer here, the one we can eliminate easily is the 13Q deletion. That's probably not the correct answer for this one. But let's say that we don't know what translocation it is. Let's say that we don't have it explicitly memorized. We look at the answer choices, and I know everybody's trying to answer already. Slow down, slow your roll before you give me the answer, if you know it, because this is a know it or you don't question, but there's a way to get here too. Let's say that we look at the remaining four answers, A through D, and we say, I don't know what number it was, to be honest. Like, I just don't remember what the translocation is. But I do know this. For every lymphoma, like the one we just saw, for all intents and purposes on the exam, all lymphomas are going to involve a translocation that pairs some kind of oncogene with the heavy chain for antibodies, which means we're always putting the thing that B cells should be making right next to an oncogene, meaning that the B cell now makes oncogenes for a living. The thing that we should be making is antibodies, heavy chain of antibodies, and that's on chromosome 14. So every lymphoma translocation is blank 14. There's a couple weird exceptions to this, but for all intents and purposes, 90% of the time on the exam, it's gonna be something 14 translocation for lymphoma. That means if you see 814 or 1114, you're not looking at a leukemia, you're looking at lymphoma. You have Burkitt's lymphoma, mantle cell lymphoma on our answer choices. It cannot be those guys. I'm gonna rule them out because even if I don't know which one's Burkitt, which one's mantle, or for that matter, don't know what follicular lymphoma looks like, doesn't matter. I know those are lymphomas. They're not my answer. And I know the Philadelphia chromosomes 922. We just answered a question about that, like or that Moses had posed to us rather. And so it's not 922. So we only have one answer choice left by process of elimination, by answering questions that I could answer. I'm going to get down to the fact that we're looking at a 1517 translocation in this case for APL or AML. The only way that I could get there though, if I truly forgot what the answer was, was by using small heuristic rules that didn't truly tell me what the answer was, but left me only one viable choice. Did I have to know some information to answer this question? Yeah, we're not gonna reason our way to this answer, not inductively gonna get here for free, but I didn't have to necessarily know the thing that they were asking me for me to make a well-reasoned choice and get the question correct. Um, answering a question that I'm seeing in the chat here, how did we know it was leukemia? If you have a patient who has pallor and bruises on the exam, along with either an elevated leukocyte count, which they did not give us here, or repetitive infections, that's leukemia on the test because we don't have red blood cells, pallor, we don't have platelets, ecchymoses, and we don't have functional white blood cells, some kind of white blood cell problem. And that can only mean that the bone marrow is involved. So maybe we have bone marrow fibrosis. I don't know. Maybe I have leukemia. I look at my peripheral smear, well, there's a lot of big old white blood cells on there. So it's not fibrosis of the bone marrow. This isn't like a total aplastic anemia. It's too many immature white blood cells taking up the space. So every patient you see on the exam that has anemia, meaning pallor, ecchymosis, thrombocytopenia, and a white blood cell problem, lean towards the possibility of leukemia. Um, all right. So takeaway here is rule out the answers that follow heuristics or general rules that you are familiar with. You didn't have to know what Burkitt's lymphoma is. You didn't have to know what mantle cell lymphoma was. You didn't have to know what the Philadelphia chromosome necessarily was, but if you knew individual pieces of those things, you could get to the correct answer here, 1517. All right. Awesome. I, I, for one, vote for renaming the hour rod the Bauer rod. So <laughs> I, I'm on that, that bandwagon. Me too. I like it a lot better. <laughs> Uh, awesome. Let's let's tackle another question. Um, so I will preface this by saying this is a tough question, but we're going to get through it. And I learned a lot from from Joe uh, on this question. So, uh, which of the following medications is the most likely cause of the patient's current condition? So we have a 65 year old with type two diabetes brought to the hospital after being found unresponsive. Super broad differential but we keep moving. And that's one general tip. Um, don't get caught up trying to reason too much early on. Obviously activate your schemas, keep your thinking caps on, but wait until you have the full picture before dedicating minutes of your time to try to figure out the full differential for unresponsiveness. It's just too broad. Okay. Uh, the patient's daughter reports that the patient has discontinued several anti-diabetic medications in the past due to medication intolerance. 
but recently has had good glycemic control with a single medication. Oh, if only my clinic patients could say the same, but I digress. Uh, blood pressure is 142 over 80 and pulse is 100 per minute. Patient is diaphoretic and only responds to pain. Pupils are equal, round, and reactive. The cardiopulmonary exam is normal and blood glucose on initial assessment is 22, so scary. And an IV bolus of dextrose is administered and the patient's condition rapidly improves. However, several hours later, the patient becomes confused and a repeat blood glucose measurement again reads 30. Which of the following medications is most likely cause of this patient's current condition? So let's take this piece by piece. The question here is asking about hypoglycemia leading to altered mental status, essentially. And we have a list of all medications. So we're looking for a side effect of a, one of these medications. And there is a bewildering number of medications that can treat diabetes. What we need to do is to look at which of these cause hypoglycemia, right? Because some diabetic medications can cause hypoglycemia, some don't. Some lead to weight loss, some are weight neutral, some cause weight gain. Again, thinking in terms of buckets. So a carbose, do I associate that with hypoglycemia? Not really, right? It inhibits the absorption of, of sugars, but I don't think of it as causing hypoglycemia. Folks in the chat are already uh, pointing out that glyburide is associated with hypoglycemia. It's actually fallen out of favor, and I've never seen a patient on one of these in my admittedly short career because it's dangerous, especially in the elderly. So, okay, we'll keep that going. Metformin, uh, not really, right? Pioglitazone, again, not a class of medications I typically associate with hypoglycemia. But here is where I personally get a little bit stuck because repaglinide also causes hypoglycemia and citagliptin does not. So I'm just going to pause there and talk about the distinction with glyburide and repaglinide. And um, when you get to a point in a vignette where you think that there are two correct answers, first stop and ask yourself and, and reassure yourself there is something in the vignette that will make one of these two answer choices a better correct answer. And so if you feel like that, my suggestion would be to look back at the vignette quickly. If you've highlighted effectively, you can look at just what you've highlighted and ask yourself, is there any information in the vignette that can help me um, sort of reason to one choice over the other? And the one thing that's sort of curious about this vignette is that the glucose went down twice, right? Over the course of a period of time, right? And not only that, hours later. So then you ask yourself, is one of these two longer acting than the other one? Because typically in the hospital, we give patients some OJ, we give them some dextrose or some dextrose containing gel, or if they're uptended, we inject them with, with um, dextrose containing fluids, and that's it, you've solved the situation. But the curious part here is that it's happened twice. And I'll be honest, this is not something that is classically thought, uh, taught in step one courses, in the classic step one resources. But it turns out that glyburide is a longer acting medication than repaglinide. And this is something I've, I've learned very recently. Um, and for that reason, it would better explain the persistent hypoglycemia than something like repaglinide. Anything to add there, Joe? Uh, only that I agree with you. This question is completely outside of the scope of what you would need to know for step one. It's an unfair level question, but technically in keeping with the type of question you could see on the exam. So I'm both saying it's an unfair question because duration of action for medications is not something that is commonly tested on step one. You can make an argument that you need to know the difference between insulin, Lispart, Asp mm -hmm. or Lispro, Aspart, and Glargine, for instance. But knowing the duration of action for these medications just does not seem appropriate for step one level knowledge. But you might get asked something like this on the exam. And when that happens, you just got to go with your gut. 
there are questions like this where there is legitimately no way that you would reasonably be expected to know this material. And yet here you are faced with that question. It's frustrating when it happens, but you do your best and you say, I know there's only two hypoglycemic agents on this list. So I got to go with one of them. And then you go with your gut and you go with whatever one you feel more comfortable with. Ultimately, it's not very fun when that happens, but if you can get down to the 50-50 on this question, then you've done your due diligence. You've done the most that you can. And sometimes you just got to pat yourself on the back for doing the most that you can. All right, so now another question that is outside the scope of what you would be expected to know on step one, because this question is honestly simply too hard. This is a question that is too difficult because there's too much going on with it. And it introduces a graph that we may not be able to understand or answer with the level of knowledge that would be required for step one. So I'm going to start out a little bit backwards in this case by looking at the graph itself. This graph is one of our Starling curve graphs. And it's important to point out that there are only certain changes that you can be expected to fully understand or reproduce on the exam. You do need to know how this graph works. And so if Moses, I can ask you to move the slide one forward so we can just take a look at what's within the parameters of the exam. This is the stuff that you need to know. This is the testable material when it comes to our Starling curve or cardiac function curve, vascular function curve. And the basic idea is this, you have two curves that interact. One of them is how good the heart works one of them is how much volume returns to the heart via the veins. And the amount of blood going into and out of the heart is the intersection point. You can only pump out what you get in and you can only get in what you've already pumped out. It's a cycle. So if you want to change what's happening on this graph, you can manipulate how the heart works. You can change the red curve by changing contractility. If you want to change the blue curve, you can change the blood volume, more blood going back into the heart because of IV saline infusion, or less blood going back into the heart because of bleeding out, for instance. Or you could change both curves at once, and this is the tricky one on the far right side of the screen, by lowering or increasing systemic vascular resistance. You change both how the heart is pumping against the tightened arteries, but then also how well the blood rushes back into the venous system by dilating or squeezing the arteries. But here is the takeaway. You can change the red curve, you can change the blue curve, or you can cause both curves to shift up, moving the intersection point vertical, or you can cause both curves to shift down, moving the intersection point directly vertically downwards. That's all you got. Red curve changes, blue curve changes, both go up, both go down. These are the rules as laid out by first aid. If you go back to the question now, Moses, we broke the rules. We did something we weren't allowed to do. You're not supposed to know what this graph is showing you. If you do, kudos to you, because I didn't when I was putting this together. The idea here is that this is too complicated. If you were to look at this graph, you would initially think on the exam, I don't know what that is. And so therefore I'm in trouble. Therefore I need to panic. And therefore I need to either spend seven minutes on this question or just do an answer and move on. And neither of those approaches really seem likely to give you the best possible result here. So let's read the question now knowing that this graph is super spooky and super scary. They ask us, which of the following is the most likely diagnosis in this patient? And they tell us it's an 18 year old man brought to the ED after a motor vehicle collision, trauma question. Patient's medical history includes celiac disease, recurrent sinusitis, and some, several episodes of hepatitis media into adolescence. He was in a car crash. Thanks for that information, moving on. His blood pressure on arrival is 80 over 50, quite low. Pulse is 120, quite fast. And physical exam shows pallor. And bedside ultrasound shows a splenic laceration. Well, there's your explanation. Car crash, lacerated the spleen, bleeding into the abdomen. So we decide to give him a transfusion of O negative packed red blood cells. Makes sense. But then, on top of everything, during the transfusion, the patient develops facial swelling, generalized hives, shortness of breath. So. Can anybody tell me what kind of transfusion reaction does this look like if this patient is developing hives, shortness of breath, and facial swelling during the transfusion? We're not even done yet. The, the new blood touches his blood and he blows up like a balloon. Ooh, very good answers here. So I'm seeing a lot of people saying 
anaphylaxis. This is an anaphylactic reaction, which is the only immediate transfusion reaction that you will end up seeing. Even the hemo hemolytic reaction can take several minutes to an hour to occur, but an anaphylactic reaction, an immediate IgE response to something that transfused blood could end up causing this reaction. And by diagnosing this patient clinically, we've already come to our answer, which is anaphylaxis down below. Now, let's say that you didn't know that this was anaphylaxis. That's okay, this is really hard. I saw some people answer this in the chat already, but can anybody tell me why you get anaphylaxis from a blood transfusion? Okay, good, I'm seeing antigens in the blood. And also two answers here. One person saying IgA deficiency, which is correct. And others are saying wrong blood type. It's not the wrong blood type, that's a hemolytic reaction. And that would take a little bit longer. In IgA deficiency though, you'd have a patient who has repetitive upper respiratory infections. And when they receive a transfusion of blood, the small scant amount of IgA in that blood is going to end up causing anaphylaxis because the recipient recognizes that as a foreign protein. It has to be selective IgA deficiency because they're using IgE to recognize the IgA. It gets a little complicated there. The point is though, that this diagnosis actually works with the information we have from the question. Celiac disease, recurrent sinusitis, otitis media. Suddenly this makes sense that they told us about that. Why would we care about otitis media and this guy who's bleeding to death into his abdomen? Because giving him blood is going to cause anaphylaxis because he has an IgA deficiency. So we have two routes of answering this question. One of them was just diagnosing it outright. An excellent job to everybody who said anaphylaxis and then IgA deficiency. That's an insane catch. This is a really hard question. But let's look at this from the other angle. Let's say that I didn't quite figure out the clinical picture here, and I still want to use the graph to help me out for this question. Well, if you know the rules of the graph, as we laid out when we looked at that other slide, we know we can either change the cardiac output line, we can change the venous return line, or we can change both up or both down. I know excessive hydration only changes the venous return line, so that can't be my answer. I know acute hemorrhage only changes the venous return line as well. That can't be my answer. I know myocardial infarction only changes the cardiac line, so that can't be my answer. And so if I'm just looking at the graph and I know what the rules are, I can only select chronic anemia versus anaphylaxis as my answer choice here because I know what everything else would look like on the graph. Even though this is an impossible graph to interpret, I still was able to narrow down to a 50-50. And an 18-year-old guy coming in after a car crash, please don't choose chronic anemia as your answer in that case. That doesn't really make any sense given the clinical presentation. So the reaction to the blood had to be anaphylaxis for two reasons. We knew the clinical picture and we could use the graph to get there, even though I don't know what's going on in the graph. So you can still figure things out by answering small questions like Moses was saying before when we were looking at that follicular lymphoma. Okay, um, I'm seeing some questions show up in the chat here. So Moses, anything to add while I quickly catch up with uh, what I should be clarifying here? Um, you know, someone made an, a, a great point that a few of these potential answer choices you wouldn't expect um, bad, bad shock like this. You already mentioned the chronic anemia. Um, or uh, the excessive hydration, I will point out that acute hemorrhage, absolutely, you can end up in, in bad shock that, you know, vital sign-wise looks like this. An MI, a large territory MI that leads to bad cardiogenic shock can also do that very same thing. Um, so the only other point I would make is if you're looking at a graph and it looks super busy, um, try to mentally just focus on one aspect of the graph and that can help simplify things. So for me, when I look at this, you know, I could focus on the cardiac output and I just compare those two graphs and I ignore the venous return for a little while. And I just ask myself, what is the cardiac output here telling me? The heart is responding to something, right? That, or I could choose to just look at the venous return part of it, high or low. So that's just a trick. When you see a graph that has a bunch of lines going all over the place, or just, it looks sort of complex, try to focus on one aspect of the graph, analyze that, look at the other aspect of the graph, analyze that. And then it's key to put it both together, right? Because you don't want to miss the key point of a graph by sort of blinding yourself to the full picture, but that's one way to break it down to more digestible chunks. I will add uh, one thing here too, just a point of clarification about these graphs when you see them. For this particular type of graph, for these like starling curves, like Venus return type graph, 
it's very important that you, for this type of graph, that you focus only on the initial lesion. It's super tempting to say, okay, well, if cardiac output goes down, then I should raise my total peripheral resistance. And if I raise my total peripheral resistance, this whole graph gets messed up at that point. Like, how do I even ever have a situation where I see like a myocardial infarction only affect the cardiac output curve? Don't consider uh, any kind of reaction formation um, or accommodation on these graphs because things do get wild and out of control. And these graphs are very academic if this, what then answers that we're looking for. If you start to bring into play all of the things that your body would do to adapt to any initial lesion, suddenly things become very messy on here. So uh, try to just do the one thing that you're focused on in these graphs because they're equipped only really to deal with absolutes, not really for like a really clinical scenario. Amazing. All right. I just wanted to um, reinforce what we started out talking about, which is um, we tackled some pretty challenging questions today. I hope this was useful. Um, we at MST really target the spectrum of your journey in, in medicine from you know early, early exams, step one, MCAT, et cetera, all the way to board exams, for instance. Um, and so if you'd like someone who is invested in your success, is interested in tailoring um, a study plan, resources, and advice to whatever particular situation you find yourself in, um, please reach out to us uh, via telephone, email, social media, all there at the bottom. Um, you know, if there are questions about the content that we just went over, happy to, to answer those questions. We'll probably defer uh, answering questions that are very specific to your particular situation to, you know, again, send us an email, a phone call, contact us through social media. Um, but now I think we have time for about five or 10 minutes uh, of questions, maybe five minutes or so, if there's anything um, that's still unclear. Okay, so uh, I'll go ahead and jump in and answer some questions I'm seeing. Uh, first, the student had asked, yes, the answer is anaphylaxis. Sorry, I kind of went all uh, wrapped up in the conversation there. Maybe didn't make that emphasized enough. Uh, so on to other questions I'm seeing. Um, one student had asked, uh, just in general, like, you know, as you're applying these tools, how do you stay focused during really long blocks? And the answer is to build up to answering really long blocks of questions. If you can answer 10 questions at a time, then start with that and then start doing 15 and then start doing 20. Your goal is to build up as though you were preparing for a marathon. This exam is like a marathon and the way that you prepare for it is doing small amounts and then bigger amounts. And then eventually practice assessments where you have lots of questions where you're answering like 40 or 50 questions at a time. So in short, do your best to do bite-sized chunks. Keep in mind that while you guys are doing questions before practice tests, when you're using like UWorld for instance, your primary goal is learning. So really make sure your emphasis is not necessarily on totally mimicking test conditions and really drilling yourself to see if you know everything. You can't know everything until you learn it. So we're gonna emphasize that when you're using these questions for the first time in a question bank, try to learn as much as you can from them and don't beat yourself up for missing them. You have to miss questions in order to learn from them. And so it would be a little silly to think, well, I'm gonna answer everything right. Because if you did, well, just go take the test then, if that's the case. Like, we're going to miss questions because we have to. So don't force yourself into the box and think you have to answer everything right. Awesome. There was a, a question before about the different types of reactions you can have with um, blood products, right? So you have ABO-based uh, hemolytic reactions. You have febrile, non-hemolytic uh, reactions, and then you have anaphylaxis. The best answer for that, especially with the history, was thinking about IgA uh, deficiency, which is actually quite common, uh, quite commonly co-occurrent with um, celiac disease in particular. Um, so th that's sort of the spectrum of uh, complications that can happen with um, blood products um, that are that are commonly tested. You know, if you're talking about heme boards, then that that's when you start getting into the nitty gritty of like minor blood groups. And of course, in OB, we think about the rhesus factor. Um, but big picture, that's sort of where I would keep it for, for step one. Joe, anything to add there? 
Um, not too much to add to that. I do have other answers to throw out here though. So I'll go ahead and pick up another question. Um, so uh, one student had asked, and I'm sorry, I know you asked this at least twice here. Uh, so sorry for not getting to it earlier. Is it advisable to read the last line first before reading the actual question stem? So this is actually kind of a tricky answer that I'm gonna supply here. I'm a little bit agnostic when it comes to reading the last line first. You'll notice that I did it today as we were working through questions because I think it was a good didactic tool but it's not necessarily a tool that you have to use when you're going through questions yourself. So when you are reading questions in your world, when you're doing the real exam, you can just start from the top of the question and go to try to like answer the question by reading it top to bottom and developing a narrative as you go. Reading the question itself is not necessarily required. Personally, not something I always do. It can help though, and if you find that for you, subjectively, it's a useful tool, go for it. But there's no one rule when it comes to, should you read the question or the stem first? Here is my rule though, don't read the answer choices. If you can avoid reading the answer choices thoroughly, there are some that will argue that looking at the answer choices can guide you towards the thrust of the question. But more likely than not, in the majority of students, it will bias you towards an answer. You will have a motivated reading of the question after seeing the answer choices and seeing tetralogy of flow because then every little thing is gonna look like some kind of tet spell or something along those lines. So my advice to you would be, if you'd like to read the question first, go for it. If you don't like doing that, just start with the STEM. Don't start with the answer choices though. That's my strongest advice. Awesome, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. I'll quickly, since it's the question that I went over, I'll quickly um, summarize Fina, urine sodium, and urine osms for the different forms of acute kidney injury. And I'll take it by sort of test. So Fina, it's telling you how much is the body trying to reabsorb sodium. We expect that to be low in pre-renal states, typically less than 1%. We expect it to be high, greater than 2% in intrinsic renal disease. And it sort of varies with post-renal. The question that we had today had it right at one, which sort of falls in that gray zone. And that's why you look at each of the columns and you don't hang your hat on anyone in particular. So that's the FINA. Now we talked about um, the urine osmolality, right? So in the question that we discussed, we expect that the kidneys are unable to reabsorb both electrolytes as well as water. So we expect the water to stay in the nephron, to stay in the tubules, diluting and leading to a relatively low urine osmolality. Remember that urine osmolality covers a broad range in a healthy kidney. You can concentrate all the way up to 1200. You can dilute all the way down to 50. So you expect it to be relatively low in post-renal states. And the opposite is true in pre-renal. Why? Because the body's thinking it doesn't have enough volume. So it's trying to pull, 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 concentrating what's left in the tubules, right? Um, the last point I'll make is about the urine sodium. The urine sodium really isn't a test that's used for um, acute kidney injury as much. Um, it's more commonly comes up in uh, questions of hyponatremia. But in this case, in a post-renal uh, situation, you expect that the kidneys are not able to do their job. And that job is to reabsorb electrolytes. So the urine sodium is relatively high in the vignette that I, that I gave. Okay, and again, the answer choice was A, uh, highlighted those, those three points. Anything to add, Joe? No, nailed it. Uh, very clear explanation. Thanks for handling that one because uh, that's a hard topic. <laughs> uh, so I think I'm not really seeing any new questions pop in. Any last minute questions guys try to sneak them in right now, but do you see any others in here, Moses, that you wanted to answer before we wrap up? Not, not that I'm seeing. Um, I think folks, if, if they have questions about your own study period or your own personal situation, definitely um, email us separately. And uh, we're, we just thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we wish you the very best on upcoming exams and, and hope that this was helpful for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you everybody for being so interactive this evening. We really appreciate the effort you guys went into like answer our questions uh, as we were asking them to you. So uh, essentially what Moses said, we wish you guys the best of luck on your exams. So keep studying, working hard, hopefully apply some of the stuff that we were talking through tonight. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in the next webinar in the future.